Welcome to this episode of the Uncorrelated Investing Show. We've got a big show today, so why don't we dig right into it? This episode highlights a few fascinating points in history. It talks about how one non-transparent conference call between government regulators determined a little technical detail that some have said might set a chilling precedent. But it also addresses new information from the Commodity Futures Trading Commission that literally may be a game changer. At the end of the day, this is all going to be up to the judge to decide the outcome of this saga. What's important here is that the documents related to MF Global's toxic sovereign debt were provided to the SEC well before the firm floated a $300 million bond offering. The key point is that this information remained non-transparent. This document was so important, when transparency was finally provided, it led to the bonds losing value until they were close to worthless and MF Global clients starting to flee the firm. Now, I'm no expert on how the SEC scans its documents and categorizes things, but it appears to me as though this situation warrants further investigation. We transition from inside talk regarding MF Global to a discussion of building uncorrelated investment portfolios. After all, the industry of uncorrelated investments is centered right here in the middle of MF Global. In this story, we examine different market environments and how these market environments impact strategies. We uncover a key issue that makes managed futures work as an uncorrelated investment. From this talk about different strategies and market environments, we transition into our last story which is a rather freewheeling conversation with trend-following author Michael Covell. Speaking of not holding back, let's get right into our first story and a little-known early morning meeting that may have sealed the fate of MF Global segregated account holders. In the early morning hours of October 31st, just after Halloween, before MF Global was about to descend into bankruptcy, sources say a meeting took place between the SEC and the CFTC. In this meeting, a potentially critical decision was made on what appeared as a minor technical detail, a decision few practitioners in the industry had ever faced before. This is when a specific SEC decision pushed MF Global bankruptcy into what is known as a SIPA liquidation process. This stands in contrast to a Chapter 7 liquidation process where commodity account segregation protections are written into subchapter 4. Now here's where the new information enters the story and where the recent CFTC action of January 18th comes into play. In this legal brief, the CFTC pointed to specific language in the bankruptcy code that clearly documents the case law for supporting superiority for commodity segregated accounts. This is a big development and it shows the agency is supporting investor protections. Former CFTC Chairman Philip McBride Johnson made a strong statement that clearly indicated the integrity of the futures markets is dependent on the sanctity of a segregated account. But perhaps more compelling is the interview with the woman who is considered the architect of the bankruptcy code process, Andrea Corcoran. Ms. Corcoran was among those that crafted the bankruptcy liquidation provisions and she covered broker-dealer FCM liquidation issues in an article that dates back to 1993. It's actually amazing how the issues she identified then have now come to roost with MF Global. So this is not only a woman who knows the law, but she knows the intent behind the law. In the article released on the website, she strongly affirmed that SIPA liquidation processes contain very specific language granting the superiority to segregated commodity accounts. Sources say the CFTC is not in a position to pursue legal matters on behalf of MF Global segregated account holders, but they're lending support to the cause by providing critical disclosure. It appears that the CFTC has set legal matters on a tee for MF Global investor legal representatives to pick up, and many of these leads have been provided in the CFTC legal document, according to sources. 
My analysis is that the futures and options industry has always been brainwashed with the concept of segregated accounts come before all else. This is the core foundation, a point for the integrity of the futures markets. Legal sources say the Chapter 7 liquidation process has ironclad protections for commodity accounts. The CFTC is presenting a strong case in favor of segregated protections in a SIPA liquidation that cannot be ignored. The big question is, does a SIPA liquidation carry with it the same ironclad legal protections as a Chapter 7? That one is going to be for a judge to decide. This MF Global saga just gets more and more interesting as time goes by. And the next story is really unusual because we address documents that related to MF Global that may have been withheld during a critical bond offering. So let's get right into the story. On the Opalesk website and in the upcoming Opalesk Future Strategies publication, I wrote an article that outlined how critical documents disclosing MF Global's sovereign debt exposure was suspiciously delayed in release until after MF Global sold $300 million worth of bonds to professional investors, according to compliance sources I quoted in the article. Once this sovereign debt exposure was made public, the bonds eventually became near worthless and MF Global clients began to flee the firm which was followed by their ultimate bankruptcy. So in other words, the documents in question were absolutely critical to professional investors having a clear picture of MF Global's financial condition. As the article points out, what was suspicious was not only the delay of releasing the information, but the filing stamp dates that were initially made to appear as though the documents were received after the bond offering. Later in the year, the SEC took down the old document, surreptitiously changing the filing stamp date to the correct date and then replaced the document with a different version. In this new document, different notations highlighted how attention was being paid within the SEC to Mr. Corzine's sovereign debt exposure. Commenting on the situation, SEC spokesperson John Nestor essentially said the agency does not have any specific timeline as to when documents get disclosed to the public and that such disclosure may also take place on MF Global's website. In no way is this an indictment of the SEC. The SEC is a large organization with people who are dedicated to protecting professional investors. It is to say that there is potentially individuals strategically placed within the organization that might not always fight for transparency and investor protections. Perhaps the best solution to the problem is to provide transparency. Allow the situation to be open so that everyone can see who the power players are and how they interacted with Mr. Corzine. Such transparency sometimes can be the best regulator of all. In this next report, we're going to get into portfolio development for managed futures, and this is important. We're going to start to look at how uncorrelated investment portfolios are built based on market environments. With a looming debt crisis, now might be the time to understand how an investment unhinged to the performance of the stock market might operate. There are a number of credible people in the industry who have different methods to design and build uncorrelated investment portfolios. When I develop an uncorrelated portfolio, what I first like to do is consider market environments. It really answers the question at a high level what market forces influence performance, particularly performance generated during those rare moments of crisis. Here's an example of considering performance drivers. If you look at stock investments, real estate, and even long-only commodities, their performance driver is generally considered to be economic prosperity. What I like to do is take a look at the managed futures and then break it down by its market environment. The primary strategy in managed futures is trend following, which is generally driven by a market environment of price persistence. When the price of a given commodity goes either higher or lower, and consistently moves in one direction over a period of time, 
These are the market environments that are generally considered to be potentially positive for a trend following strategy. Conversely, when a strong consistent price trend is not in place, these strategies might experience enhanced risk. Now, it's important to note from a risk management standpoint, there's a difference between strategy risk and individual manager risk. I outline this in Chapter 11 of the book, High Performance Managed Futures. Some of the other strategies I look at are, for instance, spread arbitrage trading. Spread arb programs are often influenced by the performance driver of price dislocation and convergence back to a mean. We also consider option strategies and volatility strategies. Often here, the performance driver is considered volatility. It's interesting with these strategies because the short volatility version of these strategies can actually work inverse from that of a trend trader. Trend traders, for instance, might benefit from market volatility if it creates a price trend. I've provided this as a background because it's a great introduction to our next interview with best-selling author Michael Covell. I'm here in San Diego with Michael Covell, author of the book Trend Following and my favorite, Trend Commandments. I love some of your frankness in that book. It was really refreshing. Michael also directed the movie Broke, which talks about the mortgage crisis, and you have some real good insight in that, that movie. And I think it applies to today with the, the current debt crisis. So Michael has, uh, has really had an accomplished background. And I, I think the first thing when I read your books, the first question that came to my mind was, how did you get into trend following? And, and what, what was that light bulb that went off in, in your mind? I still recall to this day exactly. It was 1994 picked up Financial World's top 100 paid traders on Wall Street. And like number 35 was Jerry Parker of Chesapeake Capital. And it said he had been to this training program and he had learned to trade technical trading methods. I was like, hmm, what's that? There you go. That's the start right there. Wow, fascinating. Chesapeake, uh, I think they trade a fair amount of single stock futures and they just have a long-term trend following. So, so you got your first integration into trend following through long-term trend followers. Absolutely. 100% I mean, trend following. I mean, really through the turtles initially and then broadening out to many other traders in the trend following space. A lot of the names that we all know, the, the Dunn Capitals, the John Henrys, the old standards, and a lot of the new guys too, the Salem Abrahams, the David Hardings. That's funny. You called David Harding a new guy. <laughs> well, he, he, might, he might hate to say it that way because if you look back, he's been around in this industry for 25 plus years, right. but I guess new in terms of getting the notoriety and doing very well in the last five or six years. Give me some of your impressions on some of the personalities in this industry, because I find them so fascinating. And you read your book, uh, Trend Following, and you really get a sense of some of those people. I'm lucky, because even beyond trend following, these men have affected how I view the world. I mean, if you sit down with the likes of a David Harding and you learn from him, or a Bill Dunn, or you know, an Ed Sakota, a Salem Abraham, these men have a certain can-do spirit, a certain I'm going to make this happen. Very entrepreneurial, and uh, those 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 views they have they've affected how I write my books, run my business. Absolutely, yeah, that's fantastic stuff. Um, tell me one of the one of the most interesting stories that you can tell in a public forum about uh, a trader. Sure, this is a it's a little political, not necessarily meant to be, but so years ago when I first met Ed Sakota, we started to have some conversations, and this was over a decade ago, and he really wouldn't talk to me until I read Atlas Shrugged. And I thought that was really interesting. I had to go read a thousand page book before I could talk to him. And I thought that was really interesting. And he wasn't trying to make a political statement. It was more the can do aspect of Rand in that book. So it was, it was very interesting. Well, you know, not to get political, but uh, it's interesting, you know, Greenspan used to be a huge Ayn Rand disciple. And uh, recently he's been changing his tune. As recently as last summer, he was talking about regulation, and he actually made reference to the managed futures regulation, which I was stunned by. He said he likes cross-party counter-surveillance. Well, that's a regulation component of 
manage futures because you have account segregation. So in effect, Greenspan was speaking to our regulation. Now, you and I have had a number of discussions. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put them out here. N neither of us like the word manage futures. Uh, and there are a lot of people in this industry who don't. I wrote about it in chapter four. I put it in there. All right, first up, I'm gonna put my thoughts on the table and then let's have this discussion. Because he, we, we initially started talking and, you, and you, wanted, you wanted to say managed futures is based on trend following. Let's call it trend following. I've seen people, there have been a number of people have said that. It, in a lot of respects, there's credibility to it because that's how the industry was founded. I think things, I, li I like the diversity of the strategies. I like spread arb trading. Even option short volatility, when it's properly hedged and properly covered, it performs differently in a different market environment. So anyway, he and I have had this conversation and a number of people have had about managed futures. I think from a regulatory standpoint, the word managed futures doesn't seem too compliant to me. I mean, it's talking about managing a future. And one of the things that you pick up in your book about trend following, managed futures doesn't predict anything. There's not a crystal ball we use. There's logical projections. We look at probability. You know, nothing is 100% certain. It's just a matter of looking at probability analysis. So that term manage futures I think is misleading because you can't manage a future. I point that out in chapter four of my book. But anyway, okay, those are my thoughts. I got my pitch in. You, you have that. Well, you know, I think anyone that's read my stuff knows that I focus on trend following. And so I've had to deal with over the years the idea that managed futures and trend following have become synonymous to some degree, or they're used interchangeably. And that's a little frustrating for me because I don't follow every strategy that comes under the managed futures umbrella. And I guess it doesn't make a lot of conceptual sense to me if you have all these multiple strategies and they're common, you know, the common connection is an instrument. I'm not so sure that's enough of a connection that they should all be grouped together on the same farm. I mean, trend following is one strategy, stat arb is another strategy. These are just different strategies. I'm not so sure I understand the need to even have these be on the same team because the strategies are so different. I mean, they're not. Our regulation drives the distribution channel. So everyone in this entire industry has to have a consistent distribution channel. And if you look at any business, the distribution channel is typically the most important component of that business. So I think the, the regulation ties us together. I think the instruments trade it. I think the instruments actually are a reason for the lack of correlation. I have a background in a short volatility strategy along the yield curve. So I know that reasonably well. And I know it's because of that option strategy that you can do that type of spread arb trading. I know that a lot of the spread arb traders in Chicago who primarily have come off the floor, that's the, one of the primary strategies you used to see in the ag pit. So they came off the floor and then they, they took that same thing. It's based on different delivery months. Now in trend following, you don't have this, you don't, you're not using the optionality and the time component of the futures contract as much, but I've seen some good trend followers go with, with futures contracts a, a year out. I've seen that before and I've seen them actually vary delivery time frames with the futures. So I think from that standpoint, I think that uh, you know, it, managed futures is tied together by the regulatory structure and by the contract, in my mind. Trend following is a strategy. So if you, you're still buying and selling futures contracts with a specific purpose, it's not just the instrument alone that's delivering the return. You know, because you could go try and buy and hold XYZ instrument, and that's not going to work. So it, it's having a a dedicated strategy that says, I'm going to enter here, I'm going to exit there, here's my bet size, here's the markets I'm going to track, here's the portfolio I'm going to track, and it's not always the same. So uh, to me, the instrument is one aspect, and but it's the strategy. Okay, well, let me throw this at you. In terms of instrument, here's another thing that ties all these programs together, is their use of margin and their use of leverage. Now, trend following, I've seen trend followers, you know, get uh, up to 25, 35% margin equity. And I've seen them get down to 5%. And I know that they use that margin to equity as a point in their strategy. They all do it. Spread ARB does it. Uh, options volatility, option volatility strategies, the margin equity can be up to 40, 50%. That's 
you know, there's no guarantee of how things are gonna look, but the strategy has different requirements across this margin equity, which is unique. There's no other margin to equity kind of investment available. No, but this is great. I mean, if, you've, if you're on the right side of a move as a trend follower and they're gonna give you this extra tool, this leverage tool that you can gear up and you've got your risk management in place, man, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Who wouldn't want this? Tend to like the smoother volatility. I think that's something, I think the primary benefit at this moment in economic history, and let's start to turn it to that discussion. Right now, we're in a situation of, of government debt. There's a good case to be made that volatility is gonna be the stock market norm. We're gonna have political fights over who's gonna give up what. That's not gonna be a good stock market investing environment, in my opinion. You directed the movie Broke. Let's talk it through. What do you see? Yeah, Broke was a, was a fun project where I got to go around three continents, interviewed over 100 people, Nobel Prize winners, to some of the traders we're talking about. And it was really just my effort to kind of get behind the scenes and look at how this crisis had unfolded. Very simple. It's just a bubble. You know, whether it was the big banks, and look, I'm Goldman Sachs. I don't think there's much of a case you can make today that Goldman Sachs should still exist. They got a bailout. Bear and Lehman did it. How do you feel about government bailing out certain institutions or certain segments of society? Are we moving towards a socialistic society? I don't know. It's like a friends with benefits society. I mean, it's... Uh... We just had a big bubble and everyone benefited. Goldman Sachs benefited. A lot of men in the streets benefited. I mean, there's, you know, folks with no job buying five condos in Miami. And, you know, so everyone was guilty. Everyone was guilty. And you could argue someone started it here, someone started it there. Everyone participated. And if the bubble didn't pop, nobody would be complaining today. You know, if the dot com bubble didn't pop, no one would have been complaining. And so I think at the end of the day, we've got to look at ourselves. Okay. And I say at the end of my movie, I say, look, if you are looking to government, Wall Street, or listening to media, if you're looking at any of those options as a solution for your wealth building life, you got a long wait. In fact, you're probably never going to get there. I mean, so it's got to be an internal thing. You've got to say to yourself, okay, what strategy can I employ? What investors can I hire? What traders can I hire to help me to make wealth? Because these other things, you know, Occupy Wall Street, God bless them. I know why they're there. I mean, they're there because they're upset. Well, okay, I think they're there because they fundamentally think something's wrong. They don't know what it is. No one on the, in that movement can verbalize what, what they're thinking, but I think they know something's wrong. Look, I think there's something wrong too. Why did, why did Lehman go under and Goldman Sachs still exist? Clearly there's something wrong, but what do you do? We only live one time, okay? I know for my life, I'm gonna be far more productive making something happen, work, going to work every day, than you know, putting the patrulli on, grabbing a bong, going to occupy Wall Street. I mean, I'm just, I'm <laughs> okay. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take the opposite side of that argument because I agree with you 100. <laughs> percent you, know, you know what's funny? They, they don't have any idea of what they want, but I think it's interesting that they know that something's wrong. The Greece, look at Greece. They got to 126 uh, percent GDP to debt. And that's when it caved in. We can we can create currency. Uh, creating currency, there are limits to that. So, uh, so are you saying are you saying that we can just keep printing money? Why don't why, why don't we just put a printing press down? I'd like my printing press. Would you put it down there for me? Inflation, inflation is a limit. So if we get too much inflation, we're all in trouble. Um, look, I don't have a solution. I have no earthly idea what the politicians are going to do. All I can do is concentrate on myself. We could sit here, and everyone can sit here and have this banter. Clearly. It's not a good situation where the Fed is creating bubbles on a regular basis. Okay, a number of top economists have said that this is a bubble predicted just like the mortgage crisis. You know, the mortgage crisis. I mean, seriously, why are we sitting here today? We're sitting here talking about this today because, frankly, something that happened in August of 1998. We're sitting here because of long-term capital, because they bailed out long-term capital. A short volatility strategy. Now, and here's the thing. See, here, here's the thing about that short volatility yes, strategy. Made a ton of money during that period. Uh, who did? Trend followers made an absolute fortune when long-term capital went belly up. Okay, well, because it created a trend. It created price momentum and price persistence. Bad strategy that LTCM had. It's a bad strategy. It too much leverage on a bad strategy. Right. Exactly. That short volatility, that uncovered short volatility option strategy can go very badly when market volatility increases. It's a hidden risk in the strategy that not a lot of people recognize or understand. So I'm not saying that there aren't 
there aren't risks in other strategies. I've seen that same short volatility strategy on a hedged basis with risk controls do a lot better than long-term capital management. Well, I, you know, LTCM went bust. There's a couple books about it, <laughs> so I don't know what to tell you. Let's talk about some of the guys in the history of this industry and give me some good stories. Give me, give me your favorite story. Well, that's not necessarily my favorite. This comes to my, my mind right now. I mean, because it's, it's kind of the movie Moneyball's out. I haven't seen the movie actually yet, but I know, I, I, I know there's, you know, obviously John Henry's got some, some inspiration in there. And uh, you look at his success, you know, a guy that came from Arkansas, family farm business, and deciding that he was going to speculate and doing well enough to, to buy the Red Sox. And I remember, and I, I guess the hotel was lost after 9-11, but I remember meeting him for the first time, and it was like this cocktail reception in Lower Manhattan, I think it was at the Marriott, and I don't think anyone, this was probably mid-90s, it was after Barings Bank, after he had done very well there, and I don't think anybody really knew who he was, at least in the audience, it's like people just drinking and this and that, and he was just standing there by himself, and I walked up to him, and I was like, I was like, listen, to a, to a young guy, what would be the one you know, piece of advice you would give about this industry and breaking in? And he just looked at me, I'll never forget, he's like, it never gets easy losing money for clients. From an educated standpoint, if you, know, you only live one time and you have to say, gosh, are we in an environment where the government has rigged things, the Fed has rigged things, the big banks have rigged things, and there's gonna be constant black swans swimming in? What other strategy makes the absolute most sense with the evidence to back that it's the best strategy? To me, that's trend following. I'm not gonna dispute trend following as a good strategy in my opinion and your opinion. It's very interesting and I think it, it our industry needs more examination. It needs to be understood, particularly at this moment in economic history, where the case for the stock market might be very difficult to make over the next 10 years or so. Over the last 13 years, where's it gone for the last 13 years? But I think what's needed in our industry, I think our ne industry needs to explain how this works a little bit better. There's no way you can explain it entirely because CTAs are gonna keep their algorithms confidential. But I think at a high level, you know, people should have a general understanding and an expectation of risk and reward. One of the issues that I don't think is talked about much that could be difficult for the vast, wide public to understand appreciate is trend following is definitely putting itself in a position to take advantage of bad human behavior so you know, market inefficiency right, you're, and market inefficiency is people and so if, if you have one group of people over here that they've been told to do this certain thing their whole life buy mutual funds buy fidelity yada 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 and then all of a sudden it doesn't work and there's this other group of people over here that go you know but we've been telling you about our strategy you didn't listen our strategy knows there's these inherent problems in our lizard brain and we've developed a strategy to take advantage of that that's going to create jealousy envy you name it and so it's i think it's it's a strategy where not everybody wins it's a zero-sum game in the old futures business we can also have that zero-sum game argument because I think, and I've made this argument before, that in a futures contract, there are farmers who can come in and hedge their crops, and they could lose on the futures side, but gain on the crop side, so that's not a zero-sum game. So I think there's an argument to be made, and I've had this argument with a number of people, but I... A lot of trend followers, though, I mean, I, David Drew is out of Hawaii, a guy who's done very well for 30 years. He makes the argument that his, his strategy is designed to just collect that hedger premium. That's He makes the argument that that's what... That's how he actually designed his trend following strategy, was saying, gosh, where's all this, this hedger premium going? I want to collect this. I, I want you to read my Opalesque profile on a spread trader who did that exact same thing. Now, what's interesting about a lot of these spread traders is they start to use trends in how prices spread apart. So they're using trend following strategies within a trend or within a spread arb strategy. Don't let me, you know, I'm very dogmatic about trend following, but just because I saw it as a niche where nobody was operating in, and I said, well, gosh, this really needs to be explained well. I'm not trying to discount other managed future strategies. I'm sure there's some very valid ones, very thought through by very, very bright people. I'm just not familiar with them, so I don't really want to, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, they're just, they're worse than this, or, that. you know, very focused on trend following. What? It, was, it was an undiscovered area. Well, the, our whole industry is undiscovered for the most part. And I think that part of what you and I are doing is enlightening people to this industry. And I think when a light is shown on this industry, there are problems and there are issues. But at the end of the day, you know, there's disclosure, there's general transparency. I think the regulation's very interesting.
difficult route. There's no doubt about it. It's hard to access managed futures right now. Maybe there should be a lot more effort at the lobbying game, a lot more. Well, you, know, you know Peter Borish. He's a big proponer of... Uh, yeah, he is a good guy. Um, do you have any good Peter Borsch stories? Yes, I have a great Peter Borsch story. I met Peter for the first time in the mid-90s, and I met him in New York at a conference. I think I was approaching him about a job, and just out of the blue, and he looked at me like, who the hell are you? Get away from me. Are you a stalker? That kind of a look. And But he was very nice, and then I was at another conference a month later in London, and it was like in this basement room and I walked in and he was sitting there with his yo-yo and he's playing with this yo-yo and he looked at me like, okay, I just saw you in New York. Now you're in London. Now this is getting weird. But we actually became, uh, we actually become friends over the years and we've, we've shared a lot of experiences together. So I would definitely, he's definitely offered a lot of great advice over the years. Peter Boris worked at Tudor, with Tudor Jones and uh, worked at the Fed, I believe, the New York Fed. Um, I knew him one Chicago. I worked with him at One Chicago, and then I just saw him in New York maybe about eight months ago. Uh, he's doing a charity auction, an online charity auction component. I think he's still trading his own account. So interesting stuff, yeah. interesting stuff. I think it's about time that we wrap this up. We're going to have to try and fit this into 20 minutes. I, I, I have a feeling that we went, yeah, it looks like we went a little longer than 20 minutes, but we had a lot to say. <laughs> I think my final would just be to everybody is like, look, another black swan is going to swim in. Nobody in any government has any idea what they're, what they're doing. If you think the election of President A or President B is going to make a difference in your life, you're nuts. Something's going to happen that you can't control. Wow, perfect message, perfect timing. I want to thank you for your interest in the Uncorrelated Investing Show. I hope you've enjoyed it and you've learned something. Be sure to check out our sister publications, the Opalask Futures Intelligence, which is the general newsletter covering the industry, and then there's the Opalask Futures Strategies, which is our tactical newsletter that shows how to put risk management components into place and how to build portfolios. I hope you've enjoyed this and see you next time.